you're good. 6.32 p.m. Okay. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. I would like to call the uh, July 20th regular meeting of the Central York School Board to order, order. If you would please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this point, Dr. Uh, Mr. Castro, if you could call the roll. Gemma? Here. Gothy? Here. Grothy? Here. Guth? Here. Johnson? Here. King? Here. Lewis? Here. Speed? Here. And Wagner? Here. Thank you. Okay, at this point, um, I would like to um, request the approval of the presented agenda. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Any votes to the contrary? Motion passes. Now, at this time, I ask that uh, uh, Dr. Snell or Mr. Kessler, if they have any uh, correspondence they would like to share. I have none, Mr. Kessler. Uh, just the emails that we have been forwarding um, as they've been coming in, that's all. Okay, then at this point, um, we're going to go to our first uh, option for citizen comments. Uh, Mr. Kessler or Mr. Billet, I'm not sure who's. Yes, so I will ask Mr. Billet. I don't believe you had any that wanted to speak in person, correct, Mr. Billet? I had one that just came in. Okay. Um, and then, uh, Ms. Johnson, I do have 10. There were 10 submissions that were submitted up through 5 o'clock tonight um, that were requests for me to read statements, some short, one or two, a couple of minutes long. So um, we could let the one person go first if Mr. Billet has them ready. I do. Um, it is Amy Smith and... Amy, I'm now promoting you to a panelist to be able to speak. So um, if you're ready, go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, my, uh, my name is Blake Smith. Uh, uh, just calling and uh, taking the opportunity. Thank you for the, uh, the survey that, that went out. But over the uh, past couple weeks, I've just seen some things that want all the other listeners to think about. I know that um, a lot of people are, are weighing to um, go online or a halfway agenda. Uh, a lot of health studies have not uh, occurred to see what's happening to our youth since they've been out of school. And uh, one case I uh, have seen recently, uh, a young man that uh, uh, pretty active, but since, uh, since the break, and we're only talking five months, he's probably put on 35, 40 pounds. So, uh, you're coming up of, of, uh, bringing our kids back to school, super important, not just for their education, but their physical and mental health. So, uh, as you guys weigh this, weigh this option, please, uh, understand that I know there's a lot of fear out there. Um, there's a lot of data showing that the, the kids are not the carriers. But the, the big thing is that we're not going to see the data for all the other effects uh, that our children are facing right now. And that is mental, physical uh, health uh, that is degrading. Um, and so I appreciate the uh, opportunity and uh, thank you for your uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Kessler, um, or was it I think okay. you were going to be yep. given reading? Yes. So I do. Um, I will read them. Um, some of them uh, submitted their names, one of them answered. Other ones uh, just came in via email. Um, but there are, I will read them as they go. Um, the first one, are there any conversations with local daycares on how they can handle school-age students? That was all, just a question. Second one, I do not believe the schools can safely open this fall. I had originally thought it possible with social distancing and masks but so many people are against wearing masks that I just don't believe all kids will wear them. Additionally, I don't see how you can socially distance for an entire day of school. I have seen suggestions of splitting the school day 
where some kids attend in the morning and some in the afternoon. Perhaps this would make it easier for them to wear masks and easier to social distance. If we do remote learning, please have Zoom or Google class so kids can interact with each other and their teachers. Videos aren't enough. Lastly, my son has an IEP. How are we addressing kids with special needs? The third one. Mr. Kessler, yes. uh, do these have names attached to them? Uh, those two did not. Th this third one does not as well, and then the rest do. Um, third comment submitted. Dr. Snell was very proud, appreciative of, and extremely satisfied in the spring with the extra efforts of the pandemic instruction by our faculty. There is no reason to place our entire school population at risk. Tonight is an example of virtual communication due to the current conditions not safe enough to meet in person. This is one time that we do not need to be on the cutting edge. It would be a tragedy if Central York became a national statistic, if even a single life taken because of returning to school too early. COVID changed the new norm and we need to continue providing a safe environment to which all students strive to meet their full potential with no contact. The community has invested in electronics which need to be used to protect and keep everyone safe. The fourth one, this was submitted by Ms. Palato. My concern and suggestions is for the district to go remote distance learning from home by way of Zoom and Schoology. There are three reasons. School, some teachers, staff and students and parents may have underlying issues. Number two, some students cannot wear a mask nine to four. Some students have health conditions. Little children like kindergarten and first graders, it will be difficult. Number three, students, comes, students come from, from different homes and from those homes, their parents work different occupations from being a doctor in a hospital to being a nurse's aide in a nursing home or in a group home and so forth. The risk is inevitable if there should be virus contact from any of these places and with any of these persons. The virus that we are fighting is not visible. Teachers, staff, students, or staff or parents may carry the virus and may not know it. Last but not least, elementary, middle, and high should not be, should not be used with the same criteria guidelines for opening schools. Elementary, the children are just too young. I have a son in fifth grade who has mild asthma and my hope is for the board to make the best decision for him and all the other students. Palato. The fifth one is from Gabrielle Ortiz. I am sending this email due to the current situations and what I believe should be done. I am going to attach an image that reflects how I feel. It saddens and angers me that I will not be able to celebrate my daughter going to kindergarten like every other child has before. Parents need to start standing up for what is right and protecting their kids. No need to email me back, just please read and hear the message that is being said in this attachment. Think about your kids going through this. So that was her, set, her statement. The attachment is a short statement as well. And again, this is from an attachment that she sent from prior this year. Among these panel experts at a June 24th, 2020 special board meeting, Dr. Mark McDonald, a psycho psychiatrist who specializes in children and at youth risk may have summed it up best, quote from this Mark McDonald. Children are not dying from COVID-19. Children are not passing the disease on to adults. So the only question is, why are we even having this meeting tonight? We are meeting because adults are afraid. As parents, we will face many moments of anxiety, seeing our children off to their first day of kindergarten, their first day of camp, their first year of college. We may want to keep them home to protect them from the world, which can indeed be a frightening place. But let's be clear, when we do that, we are not really protecting our children. We are only attempting to manage our own anxiety, and we do that at their expense. We are acting as negligent parents, we are harming our children, and we are failing them. We must agree to make decisions in the best interests of children. If we do not, if paralyzed by fear, we continue to act purely out of self-interest. We will ensure an entire generation of traumatized young adults consigned to perpetual adolescence and residency in their parents' garages, unable to move through life with independence, courage, and confidence they deserve. We owe it to them as parents. The sixth one 
is from, I'll read the email sentence and then it's a page, um, will take me a couple of minutes. Thanks for getting back to me. I have attached my comment to be read this evening. If you could please tell them this is a comment from Jennifer and Brian Clancy. That would be appreciated as these comments were from both my husband and myself. I look forward to the meeting and thank you for your communication. Sincerely, Jen Clancy. So her attachment. Attention CYSD School Board. First, I'd like to thank our administration for the hard work they have been putting forth to prepare for our learning decisions and potential fall return to school. Our family is extremely appreciative for the time and care they are putting towards this decision and developing a plan for learning. We know that not all families have the same opinions and viewpoints and filtering through the feedback can be overwhelming. I'm sure I can speak for many families that we would not want to have to make these final decisions and I don't believe this is something anyone thought we'd have to be planning for. At the last board meeting, there was some discussion in regards to children and their impact from the virus. There has been some misconceptions on whether or not children can get the virus, cannot get the virus, or whether or not they are asymptomatic. In recent news, the state of Florida health officials have identified approximately 31% of children in Florida tested positive for COVID-19. This is higher than the statewide positivity rate, which reads in at about 11%. Health experts fear this exposure can cause potential lifelong damage in children. According to the health department director in Palm Beach County, they are seeing they are seeing there is damage to the lungs in these asymptomatic children and we don't know how that is going to manifest a year from now or two years from now. These children could potentially have chronic pulmonary problems, quote. With that being said, we can see that this virus will spread to kids and adults, family members of students will get sick, family members of our staff will get sick. The question I ha ask of you is, are you willing to take this risk for the sake of trying to restore some sort of normalcy to the daily lives of our families or for the sake of convenience? I know I must make a decision for my family. As many other families, my job is essential for our daily living and is, un is non-negotiable. As we make a decision in regards to the return back to school, we know the physical return to school will eventually be the goal. The CDC recommends severely limiting the amount of students who would move through crowded hallways or classrooms and in order to effective social distancing, schools will require a hybrid or staggered schedule. This goes against your original plan to have a full reopening. I read, I read on your health and safety plan all of the sanitation methods you have in place. Many of these expectations seem to be fulfilled by staff members, which concerns me as a parent due to the fact that I am only personally responsible for my two daughters. I cannot imagine their teachers being expected to maintain perfect sanitation and distancing for up to 20 kids. This is another concern with full reopening. It is difficult for you to guarantee that all of the guidelines will be followed exactly every day. How can you ensure that kids and adults would keep their masks on and wear them correctly? How can, how can be sure students will keep their distance and social distancing will be followed as much as possible? What about the students in places like the school bus where there is limited adult supervision? How can you be certain that families will check their child for symptoms on a daily basis? I'm not sure about you, but it can be hard enough to get my daughters out of bed and have their teeth brushed with a healthy breakfast, now add COVID screening to the morning. Almost done. According to research study associated with the PA Department of Education, it is predicted that without safety precautions like distancing and hybrid schedules as opposed to full reopening, the average school in the state would have five infections within five days of opening. If all precautions based on hybrid schedules were to be in place, however, the study found that the length of time the average school would stay open could be increased substantially up to 10 to 15 times longer. Note, it does not say outbreaks won't occur, but at a slower rate. CYSD has always taken great pride in our use of technology. We are extremely fortunate to have the technology we do. During this past spring, my children had access to iPads in which they would not have had before because they do not own personal devices. Although the iPads we currently have had many issues to be outda being outdated, we got creative and found ways to do work without the internet. Our teachers were supportive and offered a wide variety of materials and opportunities for my children to learn. I appreciated the videos from K3 level that my children could use to support their learning. 
hear their teachers' voices, and even utilize their lessons at their own leisure and availability for working families. I do feel my children would benefit from the use of Zoom or Google Classroom, like many other districts are using, in order to receive a more tailored instruction. This would take part of the burden off of families. If families cannot be at the specific scheduled Zoom session, all Zoom meetings can be recorded and viewed at convenient times, just like the K3 videos were used in the spring. I do feel that if the decision were to be made to begin virtually or use a hybrid method, perhaps this would give administration time to strongly prepare a good start to the year. Additionally, if school does end up going all virtual after the doors reopen and the virus does potentially peak, our district will be ready if we prepare now. Families won't be as flustered because virtual preparations would, would be established. We appreciate the time you are taking to hear the hearts of your district families and teachers. I know our families rely on many of the services of our education, and there is not going to be one decision that will meet every family's needs. I understand the value of education and desire for my children to get back to it. I also understand that students need their teachers, whether in person or in a live online platform. I also understand that no two students learn the same way. Therefore, one decision will not meet the needs of every student, but this is more than differentiation of learning. This is about making long-term learning possible by taking care of the health of our students and teachers now. Thank you sincerely, Jen and Brian Clance. Couple more, number seventh one, from Nicole Nadzum. Hello, I am writing to express my concern regarding the upcoming school year. There are so many reasons why our schools need to reopen. Even the American Academy of Pediatrics is strongly urging schools to reopen to in-person learning. Yes, COVID is a novel virus, but it has already mutated and is making a second go around in Europe. European schools have opened and have been successful in conducting in-person schooling without, without outbreaks. Are we going to shut down our schools for every virus that comes along? As a respiratory therapist, I have been exposed to, I can't say them all, <laughs> pronounce them all. Um, yeah, there's a couple of different medical terms. Multiple strains of influenza, coronavirus, yes, there's multiple different types, rhinovirus, C. diff, MRSA, TB, I could go on and on. Many times we are exposed prior to even knowing a patient is positive. The threat of contacting, contracting COVID and not recovering is very small, less than 1%. What isn't okay is sacrificing the mental health of our children. Social distancing leads to depression. Has anyone discussed the elephant in the room? How about the lack of exposure to mandatory reporters? The number of students who their only reprieve from their abusive homes is school. How about our students in the district whom their only meal is when they are at school? What about the students who lack access to the internet or the students whose parents can't or won't help them? We have many two-parent working families. How are they to manage work and teaching? We personally have a child with an intellectual disability. He is already behind. He was making wonderful gains in the intensive learning support room. Then the schools were shut down. He thrives on a schedule. His teachers were doing an amazing job. He and all those like him need to be in school, but so do all our students. I urge you to open school with proper safety measures in place if there are families who do not feel safe sending their children, then give them the option of online learning. Children need interaction to grow and learn. There are many wonderful teachers in our district. Please think about the long-term effects of continued closure of our schools will have on the students of our district. Thank you for your time, Nicole. Uh, another one here from Benjamin Walker. If we are not able to safely hold board meetings in July due to COVID-19, then this board cannot responsibly approve a plan with in-person schooling in August. The members of this community, including the school board, should be contacting our representatives and demanding that we follow the only successful formula that has been used worldwide to beat the virus. We keep people home whenever possible. We wear masks when it's essential to go out. In places where governments paid people consistently to stay home and follow quarantines and mask mandates, life is returning to normal. It cannot safely happen here unless we make drastic changes to our behavior. This school district must prohibit in-person schooling until we have beaten this virus like other countries around the world. Benjamin Walker. Two more. Um, this is the ninth one. 
Dear Mr. Kessler, here are questions and statements I would like to make on behalf of our family as well as others who I know might not be able to speak. Number one, this board meeting is virtual when we have a humongous high school auditorium where we can all socially distance and take proper precautions. If this district will not do a live school board meeting now, why are we having this conversation to return our children to the classroom when grown adults are uncomfortable sitting in person for this meeting? Number two, half of Central York School and many surrounding district population is currently enjoying summer free at Green Valley Pool. All these children are happy living free. We are now going to shackle them with these unrealistic decisions to mask them all day, social distance with possible plexiglass, take away recess and gym, and expect these children to learn to A, learn anything when the day will be spent by teachers enforcing these ridiculous rules, and B, foster a hatred for once wonderful place to learn. Third item, I have great concerns that children are being taught to fear their human beings, to fear their fellow human beings. Seeing the behavior of grown adults bullying others who do not comply will trickle down to the children of these adults. Some children cannot wear masks due to medical conditions. Will these children be ostracized? How do you deal with kids with disabilities? Will you lock them in a room all day like solitary confinement? We all know some children will also use the rules as bullying tactics for students they fear or do not like. The toxic atmosphere on social media in the adult world is all you need as a litmus test for what this will look like in schools. Number four, how do you even begin to handle bus situations? We have overcrowded buses now. You can't hire enough drivers and many drivers are in the danger group. I would never want my child on a bus where a masked driver may overheat or pass out. Number five, how do you even begin to reconcile teachers treating children like they are walking death danger to them? When a student needs emotional support, when the first child throws up in their mask, the teacher lets the child just sit there while others fear and a nurse and custodian show up in a hazmat suit. Do you know what kind of mental emotional damage that will cause? Number six, we will not be sending either of our sons back to the prison-like recommendations being forced upon us by the school's Department of Education. I did not vote for them, I voted for this board to make decisions in our community. We will keep them home free instead of playing roulette with their mental, physical, and emotional well-being. Something that needs to be said is that education is not daycare, and I expect the board to make decisions based on what is best for the children and educators in those buildings. Thank you respectfully, Valerie Vinette, Vinat. And the last one, um, my comment question, unless it's addressed prior to comment, if learning happens live so many days a week and virtually the other days, or ends up being all virtual again, will the teachers be actually live in their classrooms where students can ask questions and the teachers are away from distractions and have all the tools they need? Or is the tentative plan for a virtual portion to be like the last three months of school? Thanks, Christina Munchell. So those are all. Those were the 10 statements that were received as public comment. Thank you very much, Mr. Kessler, for reading those to us. Um, I do want to share with the public that we have also received numerous um, correspondence to the board, which I do have in um, on my computer, and that is uh, in need of response. But I'm hoping also that tonight some of the um, presentation will give you some answers as to where we are going forward. And in a timely manner, I will be responding to each and every one of you and sharing your comments with the entire board. Uh, and I do want to welcome everyone here. I see we have a very large presence, and I'm glad that you could join us. So moving on uh, to the superintendent's report, Dr. Snell. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. I have one thing to update, and actually I'm going to lean on Mr. Kessler to help with us this time, usually in the summer. We will give uh, you a, a capital reserve project update. Mr. Kessler? Yes, thank you. So uh, earlier in the spring, the school board approved uh, a couple of capital reserve projects. Um, to provide a quick update on those, there was a high school um, caulk expansion joints and windows project that was budgeted at $29,000. Um, that was approved. The bids came in at $28,568. Um, and the job was completed by June 18th. The second item was a middle school roof replacement, section one. 
was budgeted at 100,000. Um, the final bid was 76,000 um, with ream roofing. There was a Stony Brook roof replacement section eight, eight and eight A, two sections being done, budgeted at 100,000. The final bid result was 99,000, again with ream roofing. There was pre-construction bid meetings last week, July 13th. Um, the middle school job actually started today, July 20th. We'll run about two weeks, and then they will move to Stony Brook, and both jobs uh, will be completed by August 14th. And so both roofing projects, um, one came in um, well under budget that was approved, and then the caulking expansion joints is already done just under budget. There were two technology projects, um, wireless controller upgrades and switches at high school, middle school, and North Hills. Um, both are in progress, and uh, Joe, Lucia, and team will have that done by August 14th as well. Um, so that is a quick update on the uh, cap reserve projects for this summer. Be happy to answer any questions the board might have. Okay. Real quick question. Real yep. quick question. The uh, technology update, does that help everybody with uh, making sure everybody has Wi-Fi capability at everybody's home in case we do have to do all virtual again? I would ask, uh, is Mr. Mr. Lucia available? Mr. Billet? Yeah, I don't, Mr. Billet? Mr. Lucia, I think you would be better served to uh, answer that. Yes, thank you. Um, the equipment that we are doing for Capital Reserve is actual hardware infrastructure inside the building and thus would not uh, do anything extra for those students at home. So it's, it's just uh, inside wiring switch and wireless that's inside the building and not outside. Just to follow up, so what is, is our, does everybody have Wi-Fi? Springs. I just wanted to double check as we move into the fall here. Uh, every, so, Mr. Speed, the last time that we uh, surveyed uh, our families, we had about 96% of our families that had Wi-Fi capability at home or Internet access at home. The most recent survey that we did, uh, it was a little bit higher than that, but certainly anybody that probably didn't have Internet access at home didn't take the survey. So we believe there are a handful of students that we will either do one of two things, depending on the option that they select, we may need to mitigate that and provide either a hotspot or access to them. For example, if there was a live Zoom meeting <clears throat> that they needed to attend that wasn't otherwise recorded, we would have to make an accommodation for that. If uh, Certainly if they choose to come to school, that's, that's a different option. And um, So we will mitigate to the best degree possible based on parent choice, uh, internet uh, access at home. Which follows up with the fact that parents need to be interactive and actually say what they're going to do so they can ensure they have connectivity, true? Yes, sir. We'll discuss that shortly. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Anything else, uh, Dr. Snell? Uh, no, ma'am. Not on the superintendent's report. I'm, that's all I have. <clears throat> okay. Moving on to discussion items is the, uh, the Central York School District Health and Safety Plan update, Dr. Snell? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Kessler, if you open up that document and scroll down to, um, I think it's in the neighborhood of page 21 where the oh. first highlighted example, and then I'll, I'll address that here in just a second. Sorry. Yes. So um, good evening and thank you very much for the opportunity to provide this uh, chance to update the uh, health and safety plan. Um, what I will say um, uh, is that uh, there is a lot of credit that is due uh, to a lot of people in this room, um, uh, I, I guess the Zoom room, we would say. Uh, for the work that's gone on. It's been a very collaborative conversation, the discussion we have gone from closing out the school year to figuring out uh, exactly uh, what we are going to do and how we're going to approach that. Um, and so I'm proud of the collaborative work that, that has transpired. Um, Mr. Kessler, yeah. if you'll go to the next slide, please. Yeah. I'm sorry, Dr. Snow. You want me to go through the keynote here and then I can open the big document yeah. later? Let's go to the next page and then we'll, we'll move you over to the big document, if you would, just so I can point out the... Gotcha. Um, the okay. So we're here tonight to talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the update to the health and safety plan. Just to keep everybody on the same page, we approved this plan on June 29th, 2020, at the board meeting, um, and in which time we approved a plan that, that uh, selected a uh, full reopen, our students coming back to school, and then again, if you remember that document, we filled in all of the areas that we were required to, 
Um, and so um, tonight we bring it back to you for a number of reasons. Number one, there are a couple of required updates, face coverings for students uh, and some transportation items. Mr. Kessler, if you'll pull that document up, yes. um, and I'm, I'm more than happy to read it to you. Um, but a couple of transportation items talk about some of the guidance that came from last week about loading the bus by filling the seats from back to front. Um, do not seat students in the front row, distancing them from the driver. So there was some guidance and recommendation on transportation. Assigned seats, students from the same family should sit together where if possible. Open windows to allow airflow, weather permitting. There you go, sir. Um, and modified arrival and dismissal procedures, uh, procedures to limit student contact before and after boarding. In addition, students will move directly to homeroom. Um, again, we're going to avoid uh, the congregate gatherings in the morning, if you will, by allowing students either to go to their homeroom, their CLC teacher immediately. Uh, if you scroll back further in the document, there are the only other two changes come um, on the heels of transportation, and that is the statement that says face coverings will be required for van and bus drivers consistent with the applicable orders of the Department of Health and the Department of Education. And then the uh, update to the use of face coverings by older students. Um, it is now face coverings will be required for students consistent with the applicable orders from the Department of Health and the Department of Education. So two changes regarding face coverings that have come down since our last meeting in, in, in June um, that need to be um, updated. So those are the only two changes um, to the document uh, that you approved on June 29th. Next slide, please. Um, so this evening, um, a little bit of uh, overview of the preparation for opening up of the school that is, has taken place. As we have said over the last couple of meetings, we'll have uh, reopening committees. They will report here in just a minute. We have surveyed our parents and guardians, uh, our faculty and staff, and are set here very shortly to begin to survey our students in grades 7 through 12 and gather some feedback from them. As you know, we've received um, Department of Education guidance as, uh, and Department of Health, actually, as, as late as last Thursday. Again, feverishly trying to figure out what all of that is. And again, additional guidance, documentations, um, any number of the American pediatrics and folks like that that are submitting guidance almost daily. Uh, we continue to sift through all of that, trying to find the sweet spot um, in our reopening and our health and safety plan here for you uh, this evening. Next slide, please. Um, the first thing we're going to do is allow each of the committees to sort of give a brief overview of what they've done, uh, bring you up to date, uh, and then what I will do following that uh, update is I will go through um, the four options that we are recommending for our families to consider this fall. So, uh, Learning Committee, I'll turn it over first to Mr. Grove. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening. The Learning Committee is comprised of 48 members that consist of parents, teachers, school board members, and leadership team members who are charged with evaluating the learning processes for the opening of the 2021 school year. The committee broke into two work groups, the first being the scheduling subgroup, which successfully completed a review of the following. Flexibility of students and teacher schedules. Nothing's as it was, so we need to remain flexible. The physical classroom layout. We've heard a little bit about that this evening. Schoology and family communications and hybrid learning. We heard a little bit about that uh, this evening should uh, there be questions there are ideas uh, the second was the academic subgroup which successfully completed a review of uh, the identification of power standards so they would be in the areas of ELA math social studies and science so if there is a priority of what we teach and when we teach we need to be able to help our teachers identify the most important uh, curriculum that needs to be learned as uh, we begin the school year uh, learner progress and vulnerable student groups. So we've had uh, lots of discussion about homeless, foster care, English language learner, or special education learners, economically disadvantaged, and academically deficient. So we're dedicated to making sure that they are identified and we mitigate, we help uh, not only the child but also the parents. Attendance and support services. Uh, our goal is simple. How do we gauge 100% of our parents in uh, whatever uh, the decision is for our learners for the 2021 school year. And finally, actually two additional, uh, the grading policy. We spoke about what will that look like, and uh, we're dedicated to keeping it more consistent than not with our brick and mortar, and the teaching responsibilities of that of uh, brick and mortar, hybrid, and remote. So uh, as fate would have it, tomorrow is the next learning committee meeting scheduled for uh, 8 o'clock a.m. So uh, if anybody out there is interested in joining that committee, by all means, shoot me an email. Uh, maybe a little too late for this one, but we'll get you in for the next one. That's it, Dr. Snell. 
Thank you very much, sir. We'll go next to the school operations committee. Mr. Billet. Dr. Snell, good evening, everyone. Um, as Mr. Grove said, our committee also uh, was comprised of a variety of members, parents, board members. Uh, we had staff represented as well as administration. And we had five broad areas of focus um, that we broke off into subcommittees to discuss, um, again, these areas. Transportation was, was the first topic. Um, we reviewed the social distancing guidelines or recommendations from the CDC, Pennsylvania Department of Education. Um, the new mask requirement, as Dr. Snow alluded to earlier, for passengers as well as drivers. Um, we talked about the parenting self-monitoring check before leaving the home and actually boarding the bus in the morning and, and the priority that, um, that needs to take place with parents for that um, to, to be held accountable for sending their students to, to school healthy. Uh, the cleaning and sanitizing of buses after each run. Reliance has made a commitment to that, and that's our expectation. Um, we talked about alternative schedule options, should they be needed, and uh, we've reviewed the parent survey uh, regarding transportation and uh, what parents would um, choose to transport if they can to school instead of riding the school bus. Second area of focus was on safety and security. We reviewed uh, traffic flow to accommodate what we would anticipate to be additional parent uh, drop off and pick up traffic on our campuses, particularly our elementary and middle school campuses that, that are, are smaller. Um, the modification of arrival and dismissal procedures, again, limiting student contact. And finally, visitor management uh, protocols as well as enforcement of those, uh, of those procedures uh, fell under the safety and security group. We also looked at special events, reviewing all of those events that typically occur into the fall, in the fall, and then into the early part of the winter, including open house, back to school, parent teacher conferences. Uh, we've discussed modified options for those, including virtual options for, for those types of events if modification of, of group size is not uh, possible. Uh, we also talked about field trips and, um, and those pieces regarding special events. <clears throat> the technology group focused on uh, the collection and uh, redistribution of devices. Um, so de depending on how we return to school, um, we will have uh, quite an undertaking in terms of collecting devices from certain grade levels and redistributing new devices to students, but we have several plans in place for that. Also a review of the device support services we provided in person as well as virtually in the spring, we would carry that through this fall. And finally, we looked at uh, all the co-curriculars and those, those various activities. Um, the athletic department pr um, created and submitted a health and safety plan for athletics. Um, each coach was also required here in the fall to submit a sports specific plan. Um, I was part of that meeting. I was very impressed with what our coaches produced and they have implemented those procedures and protocols here um, successfully over the last several weeks at the optional workouts. I also need to give credit to uh, Mr. Martini Mr. Worley with marching band, um, they came up with uh, equally detailed and solid plans for uh, marching band return, which does start, uh, band camp does start next week. Um, so those were the five broad areas that we looked at. Um, we also have uh, our next meeting tomorrow at 10 a.m. Thank you, Dr. Sam. Thank you very much, sir. Facilities, Mr. Kessler. Yes, sir. As the previous ones mentioned, uh, we have a wide variety of membership as well, uh, crossing all disciplines and, and having a well-rounded uh, membership participation. We broke up into three main areas, um, building and classroom cleaning, indoor air quality and building capacity, and then supplies and materials. I'll touch briefly on each of those as we've had several meetings um, the last two months. So building and classroom cleaning, uh, first and foremost, um, we're blessed to have both products um, on the EPA list N, that is the approved um, list to fight and kill COVID. Um, we have the cleaner and the disinfectant, both Hilliard products. Um, and so we have the proper cleaning chemicals in, in all of our buildings and well supplied. Um, we talked about how often and when they will be used. Um, we talked about cleaning and disinfecting all restrooms frequently and multiple times throughout the day. Um, we're placing hand sanitizer in every classroom, outside of each restroom, um, outside and entering all cafeterias and other common spaces, including atriums and offices. Uh, we will wipe counters in all of the office spaces and entranceways um, multiple times throughout the day. We're gonna close all traditional water fountains um, we have additional uh, touchless water bottle stations that are on order and will be installed next week. 
Um, and so we have that coming. Um, we will allow custodial staff that are either part-time or full-time to work extra hours or overtime as needed. And we've um, worked with our SOS uh, substitute custodian company um, to get and, and ensure that we will have five full-time dedicated subs um, to start the year. And so that will be a, a great assistance to our normal staff that is in daytime and nighttime. Um, so that's the cleaning section. As far as indoor air quality and building capacity, um, happy to report that we have filters that are above the rated um, ASHRAE standard for schools. So we're using higher grade filters to filter our air in every room. Um, we are going to run our units in occupied mode for several hours before and after school ends um, to increase the airflow. Um, just as an informational item, all of our units turn air over or exchange the air in a room six to seven times an hour. So that, that dirty breathed air or just normal air is being exchanged and turned over with clean fresh air six to seven times in each hour. Uh, we'll run all exhaust fans 24 seven during school week. Um, we have increased the outside air and we'll monitor that because we have to also monitor for indoor air quality, humidity, pollen, mold, and other things. So we'll open it as much as possible for indoor air, but knowing a lot of times the, for outside air, a lot of times the indoor air is cleaner as it's being filtered and used. Um, so that was indoor air quality. As far as classrooms and capacity, we ran all three scenarios. We went and visited all buildings. The maintenance crew and, and Matt Shields and his crew have done a great job in looking at the size of our rooms, knowing that the square footage is a little different, but the average classroom that might have 25 to 35 desks in it, whether it's elementary or secondary, um, with true six foot distancing, six foot front to back and side to side, six foot social distancing, at best we are between eight and 12 desks in a room if we do three feet social distancing, three feet front, three feet side, and make rows, we can fit 20 to 22 desks in a room. And then the rooms that had 30 to 33 desks, at best there's one foot, that traditional rows of desks with one foot left or right or front or back. Um, and so again, we have samples we can share, we've taken pictures, we've set up rooms at all of our buildings. The last one was the supplies and materials. Um, we have a large supply of hand sanitizer, all of the disinfectant and cleaners I mentioned. Um, we have uh, touchless dispensers, other things, a uh, ton of supplies of gloves. We've ordered masks um, and shields, both for staff and students if needed. Um, and we have additional items purchased out in the next couple of weeks. So we are fully stocked and um, are, have well supply of supplies. That's all. Thank you very much, Mr. Kessler. Next is the Communications Committee. Ms. Romick. Good evening. Um, our Communications Committee has met five times since May and now meets weekly uh, to talk about the various items related to reopening schools. Our membership includes parents and guardians from different grade levels, as well as community members, faculty, staff, and administrators. Um, our goal is, and our working effort is to review our communication plans and documents related to reopening and to give our committee an opportunity to share what's being asked or heard around the community. And also what we aren't talking about that's on the minds of stakeholders like our parents and guardians and our faculty and staff that we should be addressing and taking into consideration as we develop our plans further. Um, so far this summer, we have worked on the development and distribution of an internal and external survey for our families, faculty, and staff to gauge their thoughts um, and feelings on reopening schools this fall. We are developing an additional survey that we would administer to our students in grades seven through 12 that will ask them to share their thoughts and concerns with coming back to school, um, questions that they might have that we can also address as we move forward. We're currently working on the answers to and gathering the information from our reopening frequently asked questions form, which we shared with all families, faculty, and staff last week. We've had a nice response rate to that, and we are developing a document and some online sections with specific details in response to those questions that I believe will only continue to grow and become more detailed as we continue to flesh out what reopening schools will look like for us. 
We're also working on developing more detailed information on the differences between our virtual and cyber options that may be available to families to ensure that families better understand what they're being asked to choose from uh, when we continue forward. Uh, our next steps will focus on sharing the information that is going to be presented throughout Dr. Snell's report to talk a little bit more about the family's choices and the process for identifying choices. Um, again, serving those students in grades 7 through 12 to help address any concerns, questions, or anxieties they might have about reopening schools. And then continuing to provide regular weekly updates or updates is needed uh, related specifically to reopening schools within our district this fall. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Romig. Wellness Committee, Ms. Billman. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Snell. So the Wellness Committee has been meeting um, weekly um, since early June, and we're comprised of a collection of employees and parents. Our um, focus has uh, been for th in three specific areas, the mental, emotional, and social well-being of our students, staff, and the community as a whole. Um, our topics um, have included things such as um, how do we transition everyone back to school successfully, um, and that includes the processes and protocols that might be most helpful to support that successful transition. Um, and as we begin to prepare to come back and start this new school year, one of the main to topics that we've been focusing on is how to adequately assess where our students and staff are mentally, emotionally, and socially, um, and how we can best support them, uh, what resources um, we can make available to help them with any area that they might be currently experiencing some difficulty. Um, we're also working diligently to gather and vet resources in the area of mental, emotional, and social health um, so that we have ample options available for those that might need them as we transition back to school in the fall. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Finally, health and food service. Ms. Ansel. Thank you, Dr. Snell. Um, our committee is has 16 members, and it is comprised of administrators, staff members, and represented from the school board. Uh, we first focused on the health for students and staff, and as part of that process, the district is requiring self-monitoring checks for staff and students before coming to school or to work. A flow chart will be made available to parents and staff to determine if you should come to work or send your student to school that day. A flow chart will also be provided to staff on the procedures to follow if a student develops symptoms during the school day. Each building will have an isolation room where a student can be evaluated by the school nurse and waited till a parent or guardian can pick them up. The isolation area will be thoroughly cleaned after a student goes home. Information will also be shared with staff and parents regarding when it is permissible to return to work or school if you have symptoms, if you've been exposed to, or if you have a positive case of COVID-19. All staff and students will be required to wear a face covering, as we previously mentioned. For students, this would be from the time they get on the bus in the morning until they get off the bus after school, except for during lunchtime, during eating meals, or during designated mask breaks when the students can properly social distance. And as Mr. Kessler mentioned, a face shield will be, pro be provided to teachers to help make the communication more effective with students. Proper hygiene practices will be promoted through videos and other communication methods depending on the grade level. This includes how to properly wash your hands during regularly scheduled hand washing breaks, the use of strategically placed hand sanitizing stations, and how to properly cover a cough or sneeze. As far as the cafeteria reopening plan, at the K-6 buildings, the elementary students will eat breakfast and lunch in the classroom. There will be one meal item choice. Water will also be provided in the classroom for the students. The students will wash their hands before and after eating their meals and will face seated in one direction. Nurses will work with the parents and principals when a student has a severe food allergy and an allergen-free classroom is needed. That class will social distance while eating in the cafeteria, seated facing in the same direction. Alternate milk options will still be available for students with milk allergies, and we will also provide meals for students with dietary restrictions as in the past. At the high school and middle school level, students will pick up a bagged breakfast in the cafeteria and eat in the classroom. There will be one breakfast meal option. For lunch, the students will have the main meal option and one alternate, option, alternate meal option. They will pick up their disposable lunch in the cafeteria and will follow specific entrance and exit flow paths. Students will social distance while eating their lunch in the cafeteria and other areas as assigned by the principal. All students will eat facing the same direction and no one will sit on the floor to eat. Students will wear a mask until seated and ready to eat their lunch. 
They will put the mask back on once finished eating and before getting up to leave the area. Students will be encouraged to wash their hands or use hand sanitizer before and after eating meals. All cafeterias will use um, individual condiment packets and plasticware packets. Parents are encouraged to put money on their student meal accounts using the online system to avoid the transfer of cash and checks. Our next committee meeting is scheduled for July 30th at 1 p.m. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much, Ms. Ansel. Mr. Kessler, next slide, please. <clears throat> so let's go through the four learning options for our families uh, that we are proposing here this evening. Um, they uh, consist of these four options. A full-time traditional brick-and-mortar school, that's the X that we approved on June 29th, uh, a full return. Um, and so that is option number one. Option number two uh, is a full-time remote learning. Uh, that takes place at home. Um, while it is similar, it is also dissimilar to the last two and a half months of school. It certainly will enable our families to stay at home with their children um, if that's their choice. Uh, we're certainly using Schoology um, and additional uh, daily interaction with their teacher via Zoom, and we'll talk about that here shortly. The third and fourth option are two variations of cyber schools, the Central York School District Cyber Academy that we've always had. Uh, those are in grades 3 through 12. And the Lincoln Edge Cyber School, that is grades K through 12, which picks up the kindergarten through second grade piece, as well as the other grades. So those are the four options, a full-time traditional brick and mortar, a full-time remote, and then two cyber options for our families. Next slide, please, sir. So let me just walk down through a little bit of the brick and mortar piece. There is this traditional return to school. That is what the board approved on June 29th. Uh, that is what is selected uh, for the, your approval again this evening. I won't go through much detail. My hope is that most of the committees have gone through any number of questions that you might have had regarding transportation, food service, and congregate settings, if you will, social distancing, and those kinds of things. But clearly, the, our students that choose to come back will be uh, provided transportation, as we normally do. Uh, certainly, masks are an expectation if we have um, two kids to a, a seat. Helps mitigate the six-foot distancing uh, to the maximum extent feasible. On the social distancing front, we've mentioned that it's six feet um, uh, to the maximum extent feasible. There are times we can achieve that. There are times that we cannot achieve that based on the classrooms, the configurations, and then also classrooms going to using larger space areas as well. So there's, there are options, um, but we will work hard to keep the greatest distance uh, between uh, not only our learners, but our adults in the building as well uh, to the six feet to the maximum extent feasible. Face coverings will be required, and, and face coverings are defined as masks, shields, and cloth coverings. Um, we will have no visitors or volunteers initially, certainly parents picking up their kid, dropping off you know, a musical instrument, things of that very brief nature. But initially, we're going to circle the wagons and allow no visitors or volunteers. We're going to keep the building pretty tight um, with just those folks that uh, work there and uh, learn there every day. Uh, as Mr. Kle uh, Kessler mentioned, we'll have increased cleaning, sanitizing, disinfecting, and ventilation. Next slide, please. I won't go through the plan again, but Ms. Ansel walked down through the food service plan, the increased hygiene, monitoring student and staff health, and plans to support mental health and wellness. And so option number one, as was approved on June 29th, and is for the board tonight for their consideration, is a full-time traditional brick-and-mortar start to the school year. Next slide, please. Full-time remote learning, this is at home. Again, this is the traditional Central York School District curriculum. Uh, delivered by Central York School District teachers. So students will learn from home with regular instruction uh, from Central York teachers. And again, it is similar in, in content, if you will, uh, to, to being in school, same instructional units, curricular units will take place, um, and they will have daily interaction with uh, teachers um, throughout the day. Some assignments will be self-paced and independent, and some learning will be real-time teacher-led instruction uh, with classmates. And so again, we think of a, gr a vastly improved upon version. While I think as the previous uh, public comment individual said that we're proud of what we're able to offer, we think certainly we can improve. Uh, and one of the things we heard loud and clear was the daily contact, the interaction with others. And, and I think through this full-time remote learning, we will achieve that. So whether you choose to come to school or stay at home, it is the traditional Central York curriculum. It is taught by our teachers. Um, and if you choose to stay home, there will be daily contact, daily interaction. Um, in addition to um, self-paced and independent projects as well, using Schoology, as I mentioned, uh, and provides for really a seamless transition back to uh, traditional brick-and-mortar learning. Next slide, please. I'll turn the next two slides over to Mr. Billet, who will walk us through our cyber school options. Sir? 
Thank you. So one of the options that's available to families, Dr. Snell mentioned it earlier, is our Central York Cyber Academy. Um, this is a program that we have offered for a little over 10 years now to families in the district. district we currently have 192 uh, students enrolled in, in this academy, um, 73 of which are considered full-time. Um, the Central York Cyber Academy curriculum does meet the PA uh, standards and requirements for graduation, as well as uh, most of the courses in that program also meet NCAA eligibility criteria. Um, however, our Cyber Academy does not offer honors nor AP courses. Um, it is available for grades 3 through 12. I'll talk about the K-1-2 with Lincoln Edge in just a little bit, but our cyber program is an offering for grades 3 through 12. Um, Lisa Kornbauer, Kornbauer is a certified Central York teacher as well as school counselor. She serves as the facilitator for the academy. She assists families with registration, course enrollment, she tracks attendance um, as well as student progress through their coursework. Um, again, the students um, that are taking the, the program full time um, don't come into our brick and mortar uh, schools. Uh, they, they participate fully online, but we do have some students that are on what we would call a blended approach where they may come into our brick and mortar school for one or two classes a day. And due to a variety of reasons from special talents in sports and travel teams to music or theater programs or perhaps a job requirement, um, they, they choose to take one or two classes online and, uh, and, and they're essentially a part-time student. Um, the teachers of record or the certified teachers are not Central York teachers. Those are teachers through Odysseyware, um, Edgenuity Odysseyware, which is the uh, content provider. I'll get to that in just a little bit as well. Um, this is a, really an independent learning or students learn at their own pace platform. Um, how that works is um, as students work through their own pace, we do set assignment and completion goals to make sure that students are on track and completing the required coursework within the semester stru uh, structure. That is Mrs. Kornbauer's primary uh, role and responsibility. And again, she monitors that uh, on a daily basis. Um, as I said, Edgenuity Odysseyware is the content and instruction provider uh, for our Central York Cyber Academy. Um, there are reading assignments, video instruction, and lesson activities as part of, of this Odysseyware platform. But I want to be clear that teachers do not provide live lesson instruction in this uh, format. Um, there are assess assessments that are provided um, after each lesson and or unit to check for understanding. And in addition, uh, there are end of unit uh, or end of course assessments, I should say, that are required for the successful completion of a particular course. Um, all students in the Central York Cyber Academy do qualify for a Central York um, District Diploma. Um, and we accommodate and make modifications for those with special needs, whether they have an IEP, a 504, uh, Melissa Seabright, uh, one of our special ed supervisors, um, manages that side of things on, on the cyber, in, in the cyber program, um, so that the appropriate accommodations can be made. I would just tell you that in general, um, cyber learning um, works very well for, for many of our families that are in the program. However, some that have tried it, they find out that that is, is not appropriate uh, for them for, for a variety of reasons. Um, many of our families that, that find um, success with it enjoy the flexibility that it provides. Um, they really do like to learn at their own pace and they're, they're confident in, in you know, developing that um, independent learning, uh, so to speak. Um, and, and a lot of these students don't desire the face-to-face -face instruction. Um, you know, some of the, the part-time students just, it, it really fits their schedule. Uh, but as I said, the, the cyber experience isn't for everyone. And, um, you know, some students who have tried it come back to our brick and mortar just saying they simply prefer the face-to-face -face instruction interaction with the teacher. Um, and sometimes the online learning um, and independence that is associated with it is, is a little more than they were expecting. And um, it, of course, requires a high level of self-discipline and motivation. So. That is a, uh, a rather brief overview, if you will, of our Central York Cyber Academy, certainly an option for, um, for our families um, should they not feel comfortable returning or taking advantage of the uh, full-time remote option uh, that Dr. Snell mentioned earlier. Uh, next slide, Mr. Kessler, please. 
So the other option that is available this year for our families would be through the Lincoln Edge Cyber School. Um, it is run through, operated by Lincoln Intermediate Unit uh, number 12. Alan Moose is an LIU employee. He serves as the uh, principal or and guidance counselor, if you will, uh, operations manager of the Lincoln Edge program. He would be uh, an equivalent uh, of, of our Lisa Kornbauer in-house. The one big difference between Lincoln Edge and our Cyber uh, Academy is that Lincoln Edge has the um, ability to offer not only a full K-12 program, so kindergarten, first, and second grade is an option with Lincoln Edge that is not available currently uh, under our academy. Um, again, the teachers within the, the Lincoln Edge program are not Central York teachers. All of those teachers um, are, are certified through Lincoln Edge, and they are the teachers of record. The other difference is that there is um, a little bit more of a blend with some real-time instruction with the teacher. Um, but it's still largely um, independent learning at the student's own, own pace because the Lincoln Edge program also uses the base platform of Edgenuity and Odysseyware, the same as our Central York uh, Cyber Academy. Again, the Lincoln Edge program does uh, qualify a learner for a Central York diploma. Um, and Lincoln Edge can offer AP courses, which we um, are not um, able to offer within our cyber program. So those are the two cyber options that would be available. Um, and uh, we will provide more information to families here very shortly with links where they can go and, and preview some of this. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, sir. Next steps. Um, families will receive an email with details of each option available to them um, for the fall. Um, we will also tomorrow, uh, Ms. Romick will send out this presentation and additional materials. Um, and so that will be forthcoming from this office. We will also provide an opportunity or two and we'll send the dates and times out for you to ask us questions uh, remotely via a, a Zoom meeting, if you will. Um, it's our hope that we've answered a, a, a host of questions, but it also is true that, you know, our explanation, albeit short tonight, would open up many more questions. And so Ms. Romick will con continue uh, developing the FAQ site. We'll continue to communicate with you regarding these four options and we'll provide a couple of opportunities um, for you to ask us uh, in, uh, more in detailed questions that uh, we didn't cover tonight. We will ask all of our families to complete their uh, survey selecting their choice for the fall of 2020. Um, and those responses will be due by Friday, July 31st. That will provide us, enable us two weeks of time to figure out to put things into place so that students that choose to come back can come back, students that choose to, re to do remote learning, we can set up schedules and all of that. And then if there's some cyber folks, uh, we certainly will help accommodate that uh, choice as well. Um, again, we'll continue to provide weekly information to families, faculty, staff, community regarding specific details of reopening plans through the next couple of months. Uh, I believe that is it. Next slide, please, sir. Oh. And we'll be happy to answer yep. any questions that you might have. have a comment um, I just want to say thank you to everybody that has put obviously put so much hard work into this plan it is looks very thorough you touched on all the bases I think it looks great and I just want to say thank you to everyone thank you. Hey, quick question <clears throat> um, and in that slide presentation was the second option is that basically referred to as a scaffold scaffolding option where um, you have some people at home but some people are in the school is that how that one is the, no, Mr. no Speed, we I, didn't do that did we no sir there's an option to come back to school and then there's an option if you choose to stay home um, again what I would say is this I mean we want to be as accommodating to our families as possible ultimately at the end of the day we want you to choose central we want you either to come back or stay at home and go through some remote learning, right? We think our curriculum is the best. We think the, the product that we put forth so is, is the best. So you either come back in a full-time motion or you stay home in a full-time remote and, and continue with progress. Um, my assumption, if and you know my children are grown, but if I had small children, I might want to sit this out for 30 days. I might want to see what happens. And so ultimately, if that's a, a family choice, uh, we're trying to be a little customized here and at the end of a month or so you wanted to return coming from the full-time remote learning back in would be the easiest transition for you to come back in you should be making similar progress at home with those students who choose to come to school which that's a very good point um 
so are we explaining it that way other than right here at this moment that if you do the full-time remote learning and allow us to that option to come back at, at a later date or vice versa if you're a full-time brick and mortar you can move to the remote i mean we bet that right. fluidity that would be available Yes, sir. We've not discussed, and other school districts have said, you know, 30-day, 45-day. Like, on those first two, we want to be as accommodating to our families and be as flexible and fluid. Please understand, um, we've never done that. You know what I mean? So, so at some point, we're going to build this. We're going to figure this out. That's why we ask our families what their option would be. But we want to be as accommodating as possible. Again, whether you choose the first option or the second option, you should start out and, and make progress throughout the school year in a similar fashion. So there could be some fluidity between those two. Uh, and certainly a family that went to a cyber option at some point said we'd like to come back. We certainly would never say you have to wait 45 days or some predetermined date. We might get you in at the beginning of the next week and as soon as we possibly can assimilate you. Um, but we want to be as, uh, as, as fluid as possible for our families. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Lewis, go ahead. No, I can go ahead, Kyle, that's fine. Two questions, Dr. Snell, uh, one of which, are there costs associated with either one of these cyber options outlined? Uh, yes, sir. The uh, Central York Cyber Academy is uh, just short of $4,000. Um, the Lincoln Edge uh, Cyber School is uh, $6,500 a year. Okay. And although not presented this evening, does the administration, do you have an AB plan? And the reason I bring that up is, as discussed, moments ago in uh, the committee reports, obviously it would be difficult if even possible to adhere to distancing in the health and safety plan and potential legal liability issues. So um, is that even an option or just one in which is not being presented? Uh, it is an option and, and Mr. Grove certainly could could update the board on the work that has been done around uh, the A to, A to B schedule, if you would care. I guess I'm going to do that. <laughs> would you care? <laughs> like, I don't know. I left that there. I apologize. Mr. <laughs> I, I just give the, <laughs> Mr. King, yeah, can you make this a uh, 30,000 foot overview? Yeah, that's fine. I'm not asking for a long detailed again. I just obvious concerns with what we've heard here this evening as far as to if it can even be pulled off and so just wondering again to make sure that all of the options are on the table and i'm sure i have no doubt that the administration hasn't thought about everything yeah uh, the reason for it would be to achieve that six feet so the other options are are sound options uh it would be k-12 uh the families would be designated by ak and through lz uh, kids would come either a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, or it could be a Monday, Thursday, uh, Tuesday, Friday with a virtual Wednesday in both accounts. Um, we have uh, had the conversation. We have a draft of a teacher schedule. We have a draft of a student schedule. So um, we could, if asked, come uh, with that being more refined. But that's the general thrust of it. It's really predicated around the six feet. To what degree are you trying to establish that? in the school. That's it, sir. Thank you, Mr. Grove. And Kyle, that was pretty much my question, but I, I know at one point, Dr. Snell, you said you were kind of leaning that way, but you come off there, that. There was, and and, I, and I, I think, is make sure I understand, even if we achieve the six feet of separation, that does not alleviate the requirement for masks that our governor has laid on. Is I believe that, that uh, yes, sir, I believe that's correct. Um, so that's, that's the biggest problem I'm having, which, which, you know, we'll have to deal with it. But I just, having our kids wear a mask all day, I just don't think is a realistic expectation. And I'm, uh, but, but having said that, there's, there's, there's no plan under today's guidance that alleviates that. As I understand, I'm not read. As of today, yes, sir. I'd like to ask, is, I've been reading in some of the 
publications that have been coming out from uh, the PDE and from the um, PSBA and those associations that are working with the governmental agencies. And there seems to be some things under consideration legislatively that would have a big impact. For example, I read that there are some legislators putting forth a proposal that would not support young children having to wear masks. So, I, you know, the thing is so fluid. If these things change, the, the family's choices as to what they want to do would be affected. So do we have like a, this July 31st date is that kind of like a drop dead date that we have to have their choice and then we have to hold it in place for at least so much period of time before we could revamp our plan in order to accommodate whatever's happening because lots of people have things that are in affecting their decisions that are in flux and so when you get a report or a person's choice from this survey of what are you going to do how flexible can we be for them to change their decision it's um it's it, it's an excellent question Ms. Guff. um everything is i've never seen a period of time uh where things have been so much in flux like you're absolutely right like i would love to be able to say well this is the end of it and this is there will be no more changes i think as we've alluded to we will be back in August with additional changes. At some point, we're saying tonight, here are the four options, and here is the deadline that we need to begin to plan. Th those plans have got to start at some point so that we know what we can do. But to your point, um, might another decision, might a directive come down, might there be legislation that could throw some wrenches and some things? Absolutely. We will do everything to communicate that um, and see what that impact is on our plan as we know it. But you know, just short of a month, and we need to we need to begin to put things in turn, you know, round third and come for home here to be able to be transparent with our families to say, here's what we can offer, we believe at this time. But as things change, we will do our best to, I think, you know, and influx is the best word. Just, I think it's just, it's crazy. So we will do our best to, to honor our need to plan with the parents' need to choose based on the conditions that exist at the time. John, I guess follow up on that. If I understood correctly, then from what uh, Mr. Grove had talked about and Dr. Snell, the full-time traditional may turn into an AB based on the number of people who could select that and our ability to keep them safe within the structures that we have. Um, I, I think that could be a, that that would be a decision that uh, would require a. a board uh, approval to uh, change the health and safety plan so at some point um, I think there will be a challenge to maintain six feet of distance and so that's why it's to the maximum extent feasible um, you know at, at what point might things change that would require either us to scale back if it's not to the maximum extent feasible or if the situation worsens and the governor puts further restrictions on all of that could change but as I understand it the health and safety plan requires board approval and any change to what we presented here and what you will ultimately approve tonight would require us to reconvene and have you reapprove a change in that plan. Does that make sense and, and half answer your question, Mr. Wagner? Well, I guess to an extent, yes. And I know everything is going to change every day between now and November 15th on all of this. But we need a drop dead date on an A, B type of schedule if we're even going to consider that. I don't, you know, if we're going to open school, uh, August 19th, August 20th, whatever that is. And I know it's difficult, but we have to at some point, I think, say, okay, here's where we're going if this could change. And, and that would be a board decision. If, if you decided this evening to not have a full-time return and you wanted an A-B schedule, we have we, we could we could implement that, yes, sir, and we can move forward. Oh, no, I'm all for that first bullet point. Don't get me wrong. It's just if it has to change. I guess one of the things that I'm, I'm thinking is the number of people who choose some kind of remote, not in-person school situation, I think we need to have a time frame 
that says this is what it'll be and then if it change if we change our in person thing at the end of that time period they can reconsider i don't think we can just keep it open ended for everybody from day 1 until everybody has what they want i mean at some point in time the decisions that the parents make have to at least be in place for a period of time that's defined so sure. they know they're making a commitment and we're making a commitment to staff and do things a certain way if right. the governor prevents us from opening full brick and mortar and we have to go to ab in my opinion that should be limited to the people who opted to come to the full opening because to try to take the entire 5800 or however many students we have and reshuffle it within the first semester would be I don't know how you produce learning if you're spending all your time reshuffling schedules and things like that. So I guess I'm trying to submit the premise that we hold people to a decision for a period of time before they can reconsider what they've decided based on the facts at the time they make that decision. Sure, sure. And I'm going to say that by July 31st, that, that's the first iteration. Can I say it's not going to change? It can't. But I think we're looking at four options, a decision by July 31st. And short of, I, I, let's assume nothing else changes, fundamentally, we would offer the full-time brick and mortar, full-time remote learning, and the two cyber. And we will go into the school year with that. So in, in some respects, what you're going to approve a little bit later tonight is the health and safety plan with potentially these four options. And that's what we're going to run with, begin to plan for as much as possible, knowing we don't control everything. Okay, can I pipe in for a second? So as a sort of a wrap up to make sure that we're all on the same page, obviously the health and safety plan we're submitting um, based on public response and just an overall feeling of surveys that we're going to go back brick and mortar, which is why we did check the box in the, in the health and safety plan to go brick and mortar. We also understand the, the, the hesitation people have, so you have your cyber options. When the July 20, 31st survey comes out, I am going to strongly encourage, and I encourage anybody who is Zooming in, uh, board members, that people seriously consider their choice moving forward because we have so much uncertainty, but at some point in time, if our health and safety plan says we are going back to school to our best ability, then people need to make a decision now so that we can orchestrate that. Now, of course, the AB options have been explored. I know that some of our teams have looked into that. I know they have their alphabet. Everyone knows their alphabet very well right now because of these exercises. So, you know, those AB options may need to be, um, I, you know, addressed as a fallback to a full brick and mortar based on something, you know, our governor decides. So people, when they decide on the survey in July, they really have to, parents and families really need to consider how they want to move forward because it really is a disservice to our administration and our staff and our teachers to try and come up with a plan if people really aren't sure what they want to do. Now, we did offer, there was a comment, there was some flexibility. So if we go back brick and mortar, you could pull away, obviously in the high school, or change your mind. In the high school, we have semesters. Uh, you know, ideally, I would say you complete the semester and then the next semester you switch, you know, I mean, whatever. I think those things can all be addressed. Like Dr. Snell said, we want to be as fluid and um, accommodating to family as possible, but within some reason. So people need to really think about what they want to do. Um, you know, um, again, the governor is in control of a lot of this, and I think a, we need to have a plan going forward, and I think we do. Uh, one thing, just food for thought. Jumping off of that is, um, and this is something that some of these committees could look at, if we go back brick and mortar um, and students decide to stay home to cyber school, should there be, and this would probably go to the athletic department or some of these other, should these students be um, excluded or not allowed to participate in sports and extracurricular activities? That's, I'm just throwing it out there. I don't, I'm not expecting an answer, but I don't know if anybody's thought of that. But if your child is not coming to school, 
because you feel that you, they're better suited at home with a cyber experience, I think we do need to consider whether or not they come back. And with they, that, they being, would, and there's there's policy to the effect of cyber school and other folks that can participate in our athletic programs. So we would assume that would pertain. That's to without COVID. There's, you know, if, you, if you're concerned about germs, but anyway. Are you saying that it's sort of like a double standard if you want to keep your kids home because of COVID, but then you'll send them for sports? Yes. Yeah. But technically, um, if you keep your kids home to educate them at home, the law is that they can still can participate in sports. Right. I understand that's what Dr. Snell said, but I do think it's a double-edged sword with regard to, you know, if, if you have health and safety concerns. Right, right. I, I, I agree with that. If it's child care, okay. But then it gets, that gets wishy-washy. So... But Ms. Johnson, I think you you simply restated what I was getting to, that when a parent makes a decision, there ought to be a com We can only work with commitments. We can't deal with everybody changing their mind. So when someone decides, e I look at it as two options, remote in some form or in person. Yeah, that's correct. And I think different. that's... So AV is not AV is not listed as one no, of the. No, no. I'm saying there are two options: parents who are willing to send their kids to school and those who want to keep them home, and that's perfectly fine. But what I'm saying is, if things change, on the they won't change on the remote part unless we allow it to change. So if it changes due to governmental mandate, that the only people who should be affected by that should be those who made the decision for in in school learning. We can't say, well, the parents say, well, I didn't want them to come if every we, day. I didn't want them to come every day, but I want them to come one day. I right. think there needs to be, a, I'm not saying forever, but I think there needs to be a defined time. You said a semester, a quarter, a, whatever that is, that the, the administration and the district knows the commitment for remote versus online because it changes the busing, it changes everything. So I think it should be a decision that they make and they're committed to and will only change the in-person side if we have to, not by our choice. But I'm suggesting that we put a defined time frame. When you make this commitment, that commitment is yours until a, a date certain based on whatever ch criteria we use to pick that versus keeping it open-ended as things change. Because I think having security and knowing what you're doing is important on both sides, the parents as well as the district. And I agree with you, I agree with you, Vicki, and I think what we can do is have further conversation, uh, further conversation with the admin about but I still think we need a flexibility. I'm sorry, Jane. I, th I still think we, we don't want to um, have parents think that they can't change their minds. No, no, no. I think like Dr. Sell said, we will be able to change. They'll be able to change their mind at some right. given point. It has to be very flexible and fluid. And these are the two options, brick and mortar or full remote. Um, your choice. Keep your child home if you feel comfortable doing that or send them to school if that's what you feel comfortable. That's what we are voting on tonight. And that's what they're going to decide on. July 31st. The AB option is not on the table right now. I agree. Governor Wolf, if Governor Wolf comes and says something different, then we regroup. But right now, this is what it is tonight. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I agree with you. I think what Ms. Scott is saying is that when they when they answer the survey on the 31st, that and what I was saying in a different way was we just need to express to them that they need to give it very serious considerations because the juggling and the ramifications down the road with everybody makes it just um, the transition more difficult. And that's it. So, yes, we are voting on that. But they're not signing their life away in blood. No, they're not. They're just they're they, not. they still no. have the option and it's still very flexible. Right. right. Can I um, just add a couple things, no. Ms. Johnson? Let me yeah. just say a couple of things. Um, I lose sleep um, a lot lately over a lot of things. Here's one of the things that I lose sleep over the most. Um, this is a perfect storm for public education, um, and I'm going to credit this district for thinking outside of the box more than most. Um, 
The monopoly on public education is over. Our parents have choices. And what I want our parents to hear loud and clear on this call is we want you to choose us. The moment you begin to choose a cyber option, that certainly costs us money that, quote, we haven't budgeted. And so the perfect storm is such that you have a choice now. It's sort of the Southwest line. We know you have options when you fly. We want you to choose us. So I'll give a little plug to the Southwest folks. Um, ultimately, we want you to choose Central. The moment you begin to choose cyber options are moments that, that money goes out the door that we didn't budget for. It. That has potential consequences. And so when I say we are going to be as flexible and fluid as possible with whatever happens that nobody really knows, I do that out of deep-seated need to see this district continue in a financially responsible way, also an educationally responsible way. But I lose sleep over the fact that parents now have a choice, period. I just want them to choose Central. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Snell. So we are moving on now. Um, well, real quick, Jane, uh, one yes. question uh, with, for Dr. Snell. So would it be clear and safe to say that when they do the surveys, it's basically like reserving a seat, that we, it will determine how we're going to do spacing in the classroom. And so if Absolutely. you don't opt in for the brick and mortar and then at the later date try to, you may not have a seat available. Is that true? Uh, it is true in the sense that we're going to have to reshuffle the entire high school schedule, the middle school schedule, what the second grade class sizes look like based on the number of families that don't come. doesn't mean we can't immediately accommodate you, but certainly things will shift um, as we find out who will come back and who won't. And, and so that's all part of what we will do for two weeks in a feverish pace to figure out the new classes, the new requirements that we have to put forth. Okay, thank you, Dr. Snell. Moving along, uh, the next discussion item on the agenda is the school calendar. Um, we have talked uh, a little bit over the last um, several months um, internally with what we might do and what we might not do. And you've seen other school districts push off the start of their school year a little bit. Um, and so I come to you tonight with a recommendation to delay the start of the school year for two days. Um, and, and if you look at the bottom right-hand corner of that, it reduces the student days from 182 to 180. We minimally must meet 180 days. Ultimately, there's a tall order in front of us, and if you look at the calendar without the July date in there, that provides us two weeks without anybody returning officially, um, and what our ask is, and our, my recommendation this evening, is to push off the start of school for four days. Let us have four days where we can do any number of professional development, um, um, around any number of issues, uh, diversity, sanitation, reporting, you name it, we've got to make sure that we have all of our ducks in a row to, to welcome back those students that will come back to program effectively for those that are going to choose a remote learning option. And then it really gives us a soft start on a Friday in which we can then spend the weekend, a couple extra days, shifting and moving wherever we need to do to refine things and make things better for our students that are coming back. And so the request is... Um, for your consideration, albeit tonight if you care to, we certainly could wait, um, but I would recommend the sooner the better, is to cut out two student days from the instructional year and just give us four days up front to, to plan uh, with all boots on the ground, if you will, in our schools. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions from the board, please? Anyone? Yeah, why, why not go to the 24th and kill some other holiday or just extend the day of the year one, one day yeah i mean there's a number of options you, you could push it all back we just initially wanted to to start almost on time there are other districts that have moved back a week or two into labor day there's a number of options uh we felt comfortable with with an additional two days um uh, ultimately it's it's about getting started sooner than later based on what the fall will bring um I'm not recommending, although I'm not opposed to, you know, a week or two later start. We just would like a couple of days of breathing room. It certainly seems like a great recommendation to add those two other in-service days right up front. And we still have our 180 days of instruction that are required by the state. Anyone else on the board have any comments? I do, Jane. Um, yes. I would be supportive of the calendar being delayed. Um, I don't think we need to wait till Labor Day, but I would allow, um, I, I would be supportive of professional development in 
you know, preparing the teachers and then also for the diversity um, part as well. I, I'm not crazy about starting on a Friday. I don't typically, I mean, I understand your point, but I would probably prefer to start on a Monday or, or the 26th. It was, um, you know, what initially I, I shared that, Miss Grothy, as we talked about it, there, there were a number of us that sort of warmed to the idea of this so, sort of soft start. And, and again, it, it is, you know, ordinarily, I don't think we go into the year and say, hey, let's just start on a Friday. This was sort of a soft start that gave us that buffer of a weekend, gave everybody a chance to come in, meet their teachers, go home, talk about it for the weekend. And it, it's in an odd year, I can support it. But I, I again, normally we wouldn't start on a Friday. No, I, I understand, and, and that makes complete sense. Um, when I first saw it, I was, I didn't understand why we would start on a Friday, but if that makes you more comfortable, that's fine. But I do feel that the um, teachers do need more time, and it wouldn't be so rushed, and it would allow time for them to prepare and have proper professional development. Absolutely. I support the Friday uh, simply because it would be a good um, – a good run one day and then reevaluate if something needs to be tweaked before Monday, a full week. I think, I think it's fine. Anyone else share, care, care to share a comment? If we don't have any objections, I, I will say, um, as Dr. Snell said, I don't necessarily agree with starting on a Friday. Like, let's have another weekend off, but this is just a different time. And yeah. For kids to come back on a Monday and have a, and teachers and staff and everyone to come back on a Monday and feel um, as if they, um, you know, they've got to go five days and get it all right. I think having that buffer in the weekend, uh, children can like come home and share with their families what had happened and transpired, and teachers can reevaluate what how the day transpired. So if if we don't have objections, you know, I would suggest I don't know if we would need to make an. A, amendment to the agenda to add it to our action items and just put it to rest. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'd ask uh, Mr. Pohoka to weigh in. I think we could amend the agenda and uh, perhaps provide a piece of public comment. Is that correct, Mr. Pohoka, just to yes. make sure that we're fair? Yes, Dr. Snell you and Jane, you would amend the agenda, and then if that amendment is passed, you would allow a brief opportunity for public comment before action. Okay, so do, uh, and we will have an opportunity later for citizen comments at the end. So at that uh, motion to amend the agenda to consider the new updated school calendar for the 2021 school year. Okay, any discussion? Okay, um, then the, the vote carries, and we will uh, have Mr. I guess Mr. Kessler make an adjustment to the agenda and during citizen comment we will have an opportunity for anyone who wants to share um, to um, to do that uh, we need to get a vote okay so get so everybody votes well, yeah we we have we'll a first move the action items farther down the agenda under administrative action items yeah we would vote later right well yes I think. you have we a need to vote now to approve the amendment to the agenda right you have a first and a second to amend the agenda, so you, Ms. Johnson could ask if there's any all in favor or any opposed. Okay, when I said any any objections, I thought, okay, oh. any votes to the contrary, I thought that covered it. Sorry. So that doesn't cover it? You yes, skipped it. That's it. That's, don't worry about it, Jane. You didn't okay. <laughs> we're, we're tidying up here. Okay, clean up. Robert's rules. Okay. Okay, so are there are no votes to the contrary, or are there any? I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth. Work out. There, my, my only question is, where would we like to add it? I know Mr. Billet would be the one receiving any messages if anybody wanted second public comment. Am I putting it all the way down after number 14, citizens' comment? Yeah, I think at that point, uh, that, yes. Mr. Polk, it needs to be uh, held right before we take action on that item because the public did not have a chance. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Oh, four. I'm sorry. So we'll add that as 11.04. Uh, it'll actually become 15.1. Right. What? Citizens' comment is 14.01. It would have to go after citizens' comment. The vote will. Yes, correct. Correct. Yes, the vote. That's what I was saying. We have action items prior 
So we don't have to take all the actions together. We can put the action at the end of citizens' comment, which will give people some more time while we're finishing our business and giving our reports for people to pipe in. Yes, correct. And for Brian, <laughs> Mr. Phillips, to get <laughs> react to it all. All right, Mr. Kessel, will you let us know when we can refresh our uh, browsers to include that item? Thank yeah. you, sir. It, yes, I'll do that under discussion of handbooks while you're presenting handbooks. Okay. All right. Okay. I, thank you. I thank you to the board for your consideration on that. The uh, last item tonight is the student handbooks presented for you. Um, I believe, as I mentioned my update, this is just an opportunity for you to have them familiarize yourself. We will not take action on them until August. But you can see in the work that was done by a number of our system principals at all levels, there were some consistent handbook changes across the level and then some other changes within the building. I'd be happy to answer some questions if you have them now. I certainly have those assistant principals, I think, on the line with us here this evening. Or you may also submit those questions prior to the August 10th uh, meeting in which we will come back to discuss handbooks as well. I just wanted to give you a maximum amount of time so that you had them in your hands and could review them. Okay. <clears throat> if there are no um, comments now, like Dr. Snell said, we do have some time. If you have any questions or if you want to... Um, uh, request some further information, you can always um, reach out to the administration, Dr. Snell or myself. Moving on to um, the action items, the co-curricular, I believe. Yes, ma'am. Uh, as soon as um, yep. um, my computer plays along nicely, I will be honored to read that for you. Co-curricular items, item 9.01. It is recommended that the board approve the following athletic co-curricular appointments as presented. Um, Do we have a second? Second. Okay, is there any discussion? Any votes to the contrary? The motion passes. We will take all personnel items together. Item 10.01, it is recommended the board approve the conferences and workshops for July as presented. Item 10.02, it is recommended the board approve the following resignations, retirements, and termination as presented. Item 10.03, it is recommended the board approve the following leave of absence change as presented. Item 10.04, it is recommended the board approve the following individuals for summer employment as presented, pending state and federal guidelines and applicable law. Item 10.05, it is recommended the board approve the following transfers as presented. And finally, item 10.06, it is recommended the board approve the following individuals for employment as presented. So moved. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Any votes to the contrary? Motion passes. Dr. Snell, uh, at this under, time. I apologize, sir. That's right. I was going to say, Dr. Snell, I have added the item. So if anybody simply refreshes and then re clicks into the meeting down under 15.01, is that additional action item has been added? All right, thank you. Thank so you. We'll take a brief second and make sure we update. And we'll give a pause. Find my place. Okay, we'll move on to executive and finance. We'll take the first item separately 11.01. .01. It is recommended the board approve the financial reports as presented, letters A and B. So moved. Second. Second. Are there, uh, is there any discussion? Any votes to the contrary? Motion passes. Item 11.02, it is recommended the board approve the additional dual enrollment agreements as presented. We have a motion. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Did anything change since the last time we saw it? Uh, no, ma'am. Nothing has changed from these documents from our last conversation. Are there any votes to the contrary? The motion passes. Finally, 11.03, it is recommended that the board approve the update to the health and safety plan for the Central York School District as presented. 
So moved. So moved. Twenty is going to be a second. I'll be a second. <laughs> is there any discussion? Okay, the motion passes. Um, okay. no, just a clarification. Will you ask if there's any votes to the contrary? Just I, I, so I, I did, but maybe I cut out. Were there any votes to the contrary? Okay, you, motion passes. Okay, moving on to board reports. Your County School of Technology, Mr. Lewis. Yes, we meet uh, via Zoom this uh, Thursday, so I have nothing to report yet. Okay, thank you. Your County School Technology Authority, I believe Mr. Kessler shared an update with us. I'm not sure what the date on that was. Yes, I think it was right around the 4th of July. Mr. Bieber, they had a meeting and he shared their construction update. Yep. 12.03 uh, Legislative Committee, uh, Mr. King. A brief report, thank you, Ms. Johnson. Uh, as an update to my report last month regarding House Bill 364, which was the yellow lights, which would have been Title 75. Uh, Governor Wolf has signed that into law, which became Act 38 of 2020. This would allow for school vehicles, other than obviously school buses, to utilize flashing yellow lights as a safety measure. Um, over the weekend, uh, I did have a fairly lengthy discussion with Senator Phillips Hill uh, regarding the instructional time requirement of 180 days or the 990 hours for school districts. Obviously we have uh, guidance has been provided from uh, PDE, but no legislative action has been taken to this point. Um, it is something that is being discussed uh, amongst our uh, legislators. So uh, hopefully there'll be some more guidance coming from that in the event we were to need it, either because of proactive measures on uh, this end or mandates coming from the governor. Uh, and then lastly, uh, there is a strong push uh, right now for federal emergency relief for public schools. Uh, the U.S. House of Representatives passed uh, the HEROES Act in May, and negotiations are now ongoing in the United States Senate, so that could potentially provide for some funding to come back to states and school districts. So more to come on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. If I could just follow up to Mr. King's comments, we will have for your approval consideration in August the, um, the piece of um, – the section 520 of the school code that will enable the board to count additional time beyond the five flexible instruction days that we have. We will have that for your consideration in August. That's another thing the board would need to approve prior to the start. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, Lincoln Benefit Trust. Is that Mr. Uh, Joe Gothi? Yes. Uh, no meeting. Okay. Um, Ms. Gemma, York Adams Academy. Uh, yes, not much to report. Our next meeting is August 25th. Their first day of school is August 12th, and they are doing in-person as of now. Um, and that's all I have to report. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Grove, the uh, diversity. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Good evening. Um, the diversity committee uh, reconvened in early July to continue the conversation of race and equity within the Central York School District. Uh, the committee uh, currently comprised of alumni, community, teachers, school board, and leadership team members met virtually multiple times as a whole group and then began the process of breaking into five subcommittees. Those subcommittees are relationship building, equity, professional development, curriculums uh, committee, and then family outreach. Each of those have subcommittee goals that uh, we are moving towards. Uh, the next uh, diversity meeting is this Wednesday, July 22nd at 5.30 p.m. If anybody is interested in joining us, a simple email to me. I'll make sure you get the or receive the Zoom link. And this week, we will hear from the subcommittees, and uh, it is a chance to ask clarifying questions and uh, us working collaboratively towards a better way of doing business. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Wagner, Lincoln Intermediate. Yeah, we had a meeting in late June. We have two meetings in June, none in July. Um, 
as they're working like we are towards uh, how this looks to reopen all the classrooms that they're involved in, one of the unique situations at the intermediate unit of the 1,200 staff who are probably allocated out to, and I don't know this number, but easily 75 different locations throughout the four counties, a great majority of those in different school districts. So not only is there the part of the IU in their staffing, but also in the school districts where those staff work. So we meet next Tuesday night. We're hoping to all be in New Oxford for that, but it's going to be a little more complicated as that rolls forward. And I think as uh, Veronica said, I think uh, uh, October, August 12th or whatever, the same opening date, when I believe when the York Learning Center opens the first day when staff is back to work in those locations. Okay, thank you very much. And the LIU Joint Authority, is that also you, Mr. Wagner? The same? It is, and I have not received notification of a follow-up meeting. I did attend one several months ago and report on that, but I have not heard when the next meeting is. Okay, stay tuned. Okay, moving on now uh, to the superintendent's announcements. You have more? Just a real brief. I'm sorry, just a real brief announcement to say thank you to the board, thank you to the community. These are clearly unprecedented times. There are no easy answers. It doesn't matter what I say, my opinion is going to upset a third or half of you and vice versa. This is difficult. I'd ask us all to take a deep breath, try to get through this time together uh, as Panthers. For one example, the meeting was moved to a Zoom because the governor's orders of, of folks you know, inside can't be more than 25. We would not have been able to have close to 400 people show up um, and at least hear from us uh, without having this venue. So there are no easy answers. There are no perfect options. I would simply say thank you to the board. Thank you to the community. Let's let calm heads prevail and let's try to get through this thing together. That's all I have to say. Okay, at this time we're um, ready for um, any um, additional citizen comments. Did we um, get anything, um, Mr. Kessler, or Mr. Billet? I did not receive any. Nope, I have not. Okay, so at, at this point, um, we can move ahead uh, to the action item to amend the 2020-2021 school calendar. Can I get a move? What? I was just going to read it. I apologize, Mayor. Okay, it's recommended the board amend the 2020-2021 school calendar as presented. <laughs> moved. Second. My fault. Any further discussion? Any votes to the contrary? The motion passes. Okay, um, we have uh, addressed a lot of things tonight, and we're moving on now to um, 16.01 board comment. At this time, if anyone on the board has a comment to share, I'll just, uh, and Dr. Snell said, any given time, a third or half the people will disagree with whatever, whatever decision he makes. I think we're going to defy math at this point, and whatever we do, 75% of everybody's not going to agree with it as this all rolls out. These are tough times, and I do appreciate the work by the administration. Yes, Thank I, will, you. I will echo that. Uh, I, I think that what we have approved tonight is well thought out and has options that, all things considered, uh, will give people choices. And yeah, I thank everybody for a lot of hard work. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. I have a, I have a uh, suggestion. Since all the kids are going to have to wear masks, can we find somebody who can produce panther masks to make it at least something that is unifying rather than looked at as a negative? Let it become uh, something they want to wear. We, um, there are companies out there, and I've, I've heard folks looking at that. So, yes, ma'am. Uh, and I've just been notified via text that the boosters are offering them for sale, thanks to technology. <laughs> I want one. <laughs> Greg Pottinger just texted me, and he says he has one. So everybody's chiming in. Get your masks from the booster yep. club. Uh, all our board members can get them for Friday night. Anyone yeah, else have graduation? Yeah, I was going to ask. Can we have graduation? So um, I wanted to, um, if everyone was done with board comment, I was just going to wrap up. Does anybody have anything else that they want to share? I'd like to share one thing, Ms. Johnson. Yes, Mr. King. 
I just want to clarify when I asked about uh, the AB schedule, I want to be perfectly clear um, for those who are still on. I think it's uh, fair to justify our point. Um, personally, I'm in favor of a total reopening as, as we have certainly been uh, discussing. I ultimately think it's what's in the best interest of most children. That is my personal opinion. Why? I think some great points were brought up by some things I actually had written down prior to this evening's meeting, and that is not all children are sheltering in a safe place. This is something that I encounter on a daily basis at work. Um, the number of child line reports are drastically down. Uh, not everyone has, is fortunate to have uh, multiple meals a day, which they are provided with when they are in school. Mental health and suicide, uh, both on the rise, are special needs children who I don't think their needs, to no fault of certainly our administration, were being met. However, I think we're tasked with uh, looking out for everyone's best needs. We've had plenty of people who have spoken both for and against total reopening. I think we need to look out for our kids' needs, what parents want, uh, taxpayers, certainly, if they're putting a bill for uh, kids who are not uh, going to school, but uh, also for teachers and the administration who I think are mentioned least of all. And I know in the data that we received, uh, only I believe 31% of staff and faculty felt comfortable in coming back. And so, again, I, I'm certainly all for that personally, and that's the direction that we're moving in. But I think we need to be mindful that we represent everyone. And I just, I'm not saying that uh, my fellow board members are not considering that. I just want us to, to be thinking of that when we, when we make the decision. So thank you, Ms. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. King. Anyone else? Yes, I would like just uh, for uh, my education, how, how many people, uh, citizens, signed in tonight? We had about 370. Yep, we were a high of 375 um, right. shortly after the meeting started. So um, there were 430 invitations sent out, and we had 375 that were in attendance at the peak. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, um, I would like to echo um, some of my fellow board members and uh, extend extreme gratitude for our administration, our teachers, our families, all the people working on the committees. Um, and uh, it is a... <clears throat> very difficult job a very difficult time and it's ever changing so we need to prepare for everything and i i think the district is doing a great job with that so looking forward to happier times i just want to remind uh, you that uh this friday night july 24th is our walkthrough graduation with our seniors the 2020 class uh starting at four o'clock going till eight with an eight to nine uh back up for anyone who can't make those times I would encourage families out there to just uh, go to the Central York homepage. Miss um, Romig is doing a great job of providing details, the timeline. There are maps. There are links. I need people to, you know, click click on the link to see the map where they're supposed to park. And there will be updates. Like everything else, this is very fluid. We're trying to make this as special as possible. So, um, you know, I encourage families to check back midweek. Thursday, even Friday morning, just to make sure um, that they know where they need to be, when they need to be there, that they bring their masks, and they are ready to celebrate their graduates. Is there anything else? That's all I have. Yes, I have. I have a question. Um, yes. Can you please let us know what where we are supposed to report and, and what time? Yes. And I will probably be having a conversation with um, the board members just to see, um, because this is a unique situation um, how many people will be present and you know hopefully all the board members can come and join us but this will be an extended period so we'll take um, 
you know, of participation. We have, of course, we have five parents here that are graduating seniors. So we're working those logistics right now, and we'll I'll be in touch and um, try and get some preferences from everybody. And can you also um, clarify the communication that was going out that used the word drive instead of walk? Exactly, and that's what I'm saying. I spoke to Ms. Romy today, and that's going to be one of the corrections. So if you look at it tonight, and I'm looking at it right now, um, it says drive. So um, now, if you look at that that page on, on the home page, and you go down the screen, and it says, uh, please click here for a map of how to enter and process, process during the ceremony, it clearly shows it's a walk. You're walking across the football track. So uh, the word drive is deceiving, and we're going to work on making some of those minor corrections and get everybody on the same page. I, I know, but there's some people that are – claiming they're not going to attend because they do not want to drive through. So it might help to get that communication out. To communicate, okay, so with all fairness to Ms. Romig, it says, please click here for a map. If people don't look at that, we're going to change the word drive to walk. It will be there. But if people choose to stop reading at that point, if you go down, it just it shows the details and the actual where you walk in the gate. Where I don't think we're bringing cars onto the track. So... I'm just saying. I you understand, Jay, I'm just saying that what I'm hearing is it's a little confusing. And that's my first statement was this. This right now is going to be corrected, and to keep an eye on it for any updates. So that was I think what I said that 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 correction will be made because I'm looking at it currently and it says drive, and that will be taken care of. And um, and any details that will be forthcoming, any changes. Um, I think there's a weather, there's a alternate date. So if there's any questions or any board members have questions, you can email me. Is everybody good? We're good. Okay. This meeting's adjourned. Thank you.